Our next speaker, the wonderful Mr. David Storrs. Uh, David, I'm very excited for this talk, but I hope you're going to work in some pearl, because I think if it weren't for your occasional questions on the mailing list saying, how do you, I used to do this in Pearl, like this, I'm like, wow, Pearl, that's just such a great brain teaser, but do you, do you actually like Pearl, or has, has Rackett faded your, your enthusiasm? Is this on? There we go. So, yeah, okay. There we go. So, uh, I was in the Valley up until very recently, and it got to the point where I would say to people, yeah, you know, we're writing our code in, in Pearl. And they would look at me, and they would say, you're writing it in Perl? <laughs> in much the same tone that one might say, you shampoo with vomit? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Storrs. OK, so, uh, wow. You can hear me, right? Because I can, OK, eat the mic. Okay, so believe it or not, I run a company called Biomantica. There's a hint. And who we are. I'm David Storrs. I'm the CEO, the lead dev, a few other things. I've been programming for 20 years. I, this is my third and a half company. Uh, my co-founder over here is the mighty James Platt, who uh, has been a cancer researcher for 20 years, and you know he's done a couple other things. Um, yeah. You can read, so. Uh, okay, what we do. We solve problems that we should not be able to get paid for in 2017, and yet we can. So we're focusing on bioinformatics to start. And bioinformatics has two main problems. Number one, they generate too much data. One gene sequencing experiment runs about 10 terabytes, which uh, the gentleman that I was talking to earlier who works in geology and generates petabytes, go away. Uh, they generate 10 terabytes of data for one experiment that is in the form of you know, several tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of very small files, and then a few files that are hundreds of gigabytes. There is currently no way to move this over the internet. You cannot FTP it, you cannot put it in Dropbox, but wait, you say, Dave, I have unlimited data in my Dropbox. No, no, you do not. <laughs> We have spoken to Dropbox personally, and they said, no, we can't, we can't do that, man. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> they cannot handle that number of files. They cannot handle files that big. So why not? Well, because HTTP setup latency is a thing, and they're an HTTP protocol. The second problem that bioinformatics has is that it, and in fact many flavors of science, are not accessible or reproducible. The data gets published, but the code does not, possibly because they're embarrassed about it, because they're not programmers, and so it's not the cleanest. Uh, doesn't get published, or the versions are different, or whatever. But you cannot take a paper online and look at what's there and learn from it, reproduce its results, learn how they did their methods. As a result, a lot of papers don't get cited. They have to be absolutely critical in order to get cited. If you are a researcher, you might know that being cited is good. So uh, we do a couple of things. Actually, I'll get to that in just a moment. So what we do is we provide a platform for collaboration with scientific research. We move your data around from point to point in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion using swarming to accelerate your downloads. We maintain backups in our network. We can move as much data as you want, as long as you can fit it on your computer. And you know we don't really care how much it is. We charge a flat fee for all of that. And we'll be building out analysis tools and publication tools and all that. We can also capture the versions of everything to make your research accessible, easily understandable, and reproducible. So we think maybe there's a little bit of value there. Uh, oddly enough, seeing as I'm at RacketCon, we write the code in Racket. Now, I've been a programmer for a while. I've got some experience with Lisp and with Racket before we started. Uh, James, among his many accomplishments, is a programmer, but not primarily one, and had no experience with Racket. So the rest of this talk is about our experience with Racket and what it was like learning it on the fly from the perspective of somebody with a little bit of experience with it and no experience with it. So uh, overall, 
syntax and grammar, really easy, makes it very easy to understand the code. The vocabulary of Racket is huge. This is a pro and a con. Once you know all the vocabulary, you can do powerful things very quickly and concisely, but learning it all takes a long time and is hard. It has a lot of powerful constructs. Again, this is a pro and a con. <laughs> Uh, the number of libraries is a lot smaller than you'll find in Perl, Python, or JavaScript. <laughs> However, it is more than sufficient. Uh, we have yet to find a single thing, a single major need that we could not find a library for, with the exception of uh, NAT traversal and specific kinds of encryption, because um, we need to do web of trust and a few other things. So, which brings us to the last point, which is FFI. Because there are libraries that do that. There's Libsodium, there's PGP, various things. We can FFI out to these. Easy peasy. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible. The tooling on Racket overall is very good. The web server is the easiest. Uh, of all the work we've done so far, getting the web server up and running and integrated with the rest of our code was surprisingly easy. I was expecting that to be challenging. It was, OK, set, run, huh, OK. Let's start writing code. The database code is powerful. Uh, we did end up writing some syntactic sugar on top of it. There were a few things that were missing in our mind. But the protocol buffers, I cannot recommend these enough. I suggest you go out and look for them. It's on Planet. It's uh, Murphy Protobuf. It's a binary format for data interchange created by Google. And it has full reflection. Uh, it's just fantastic. Less pro. The package server is real time. So you go and you put in your data, and it immediately puts up a package and starts adding to it as you edit. This is not good. I want to be able to put my stuff up, check that it's all correct, and then push post. So that's a fairly small thing, though. Uh, documentation is probably my biggest objection to Racket. The documentation overall is excellent, but uh, if you don't have experience with certain concepts in programming, it's very hard to approach. More importantly, it's too hard to edit. I have found things many times where I'm like, oh, this really needs a link over there, or this isn't quite clear, I'd like to clarify this. I am delighted to submit patches. I am an English major. I am a published author. I have written a ton of tech docs. I would like to believe I would actually be good at this. I am not willing to do it because it is too difficult to find the relevant place and submit a patch. That's a question of reorganizing the source tree or building out tools. Uh, there's also a fair number of forward references you're reading through, and it's like, oh, you should go check out Wills. Oh, you should go check out Continuation. Uh, uh, there's a limit to how much that can be fixed. Structures. This is something that we get pushed towards a lot. They have advantages, but in my opinion, they are not as good as hashes with appropriate guards. They are not printable. They are not easily introspectable. Certain exceptions to that. Uh, okay, and now we come to the single biggest problem with Racket. Ready for this? It's fun. This is a problem because it inspires you to go off and write your own solution to a problem instead of looking for a library that somebody has written. If you are writing Java, you will take the time to look for someone else's <laughs> suggestion. So, so as a result, there's a ton of Java of, uh, <laughs> of racket code out there which doesn't get published, doesn't get circulated. We've all reinvented the same wheels and that means that there's a bunch of partial solutions that are a little buggy or a little specific or whatever. And hey, come back. Did I say you could stop? No, I did not. Uh, OK, so biggest problem with Racket. Racket's biggest strength, you. The mailing list is astounding. I have yet to come up with a question where I did not get an answer back within a couple of hours. And it's usually from some of the most high-powered people it has ever been my pleasure to associate with. I would like to thank you all. I can't see you for a damn, so I'll assume you're up there somewhere. But uh, you know who you are, the people who give most of the answers and are just phenomenal. And thank you so much.
Thank you, David. Just Questions for David. David's professional work. So interesting to, you say you have customers who are using this. Do you like divulge that you're using Racket? Do they know, do they care? Uh, we are pre-launch and talking with beta testers at this point. So, but we have people telling us, oh yeah, we'll totally pay for that. Uh, we went to a, we went to a Cure meeting, which is a bioinformatics, biotech meetup in Connecticut. And we were not actually planning to speak, but they said, you know, hey, anybody else want to talk for three minutes? I was like, yes, I do. And I got up and I talked and gave a quick summary. And afterwards, we had people coming up to us going, so, tell me more, <laughs> which was kind of fun. So as soon as we launch, we have a bunch of people who are, I won't say they're beating down our doors, but they're kind of waiting patiently. Other questions? Yes, Sam. Okay, so the question is, what do we do to make uh, computation more reproducible? That is not our problem. <laughs> it is your problem to do the computations, to generate the data, to do the science. Our job is to track the relationships between your data, to track the versions of code, to move your data from point A to point B, try to make sure that you don't step on yourself as you're collaborating, but it is your job to do the science. Very good, one more question. <laughs> so the question is why not just put everything on S3? Uh, the answer is it gets expensive, especially since in an ideal world, you leave the code up indefinitely. And the way labs work is you have a grant, it lasts for a year, and then you have no more money. And you have to get another grant. But you only get a grant for a specific project. You cannot put in your grant application, and I'm going to spend $1,000 a month maintaining the storage for all the other projects I've done in the past. And did I say $1,000 a month? Because I actually meant 10000 uh, the costs are also difficult to calculate because there's download costs. So once your data starts getting more desired, your costs go up. So it's much preferable to be able to store locally. Wonderful. One more time, a round of applause for Mr. David Stores. Thank you, David.